web and, and uh, you should be able to get to it. So, here we are. Six ways to write a story without a pencil. This is the session you're supposed to be in, right? Good, okay. I don't, I don't have any freebies, giveaways, I'm sorry. I apologize. So if you were here for those, there's, is there another one down the hall that's giving away like iPad cases or something? No? Okay. Anyways, um, this is a digital storytelling session uh, and hopefully it offers you a little bit something different than the other digital storytelling sessions that have uh, been uh, at this conference. I actually went to a couple of them. I went to Patty Haru's yesterday. I'll share some resources from hers. But I was really excited to see so many uh, sessions on digital storytelling at the conference here. Uh, before I get started, a little bit about me. My name's Ben, hi. Wow, I like doing morning sessions because everyone's perky and you still have the caffeine in your blood. and It's really good. And you're coming right off, did you guys see the opening keynote? Yeah. George, was good? Okay, I haven't seen him speak yet. He's gonna be at McCall in Michigan in two weeks, so I was kind of waiting to see him on my home turf. Anyways, um, I am a K-12 instructional tech coordinator. It's a big, fancy uh, title that basically means I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I taught for many, many years in the classroom, developmental kindergarten all the way up through sixth grade, one-to-one uh, -one setting, uh, computer lab setting, and uh, I've been very blessed to be able to teach with technology for uh, my entire career. Uh, and the last four years I've been in this role, basically I speak education, fairly well, and I speak tech pretty well, so I serve as the bridge between my tech director and my tech department and my staff. I get to help them with a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, you've already seen uh, the link to my blog. There you go. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at the same thing. You can follow at Ben Rhymes if you want to, but that Ben Rhymes hasn't tweeted since 2009. So, I mean, maybe make him feel good about that. A um, little bit more about me. Uh, my wife is an art teacher, uh, and uh, right here, this is, this is the Golden Skull. This was the inaugural costume contest at our, uh, our, our library's Halloween party. Uh, I'm, I'm the March Hare there, and uh, we, we had a blast. She's really geeky. My uh, daughter is a ballerina, and my son is a bunny rabbit. This week. Last week, he was uh, a, a baby frog. Um, but uh, I have a lot of fun with my family, uh, and if you follow me on Twitter or my blog, you'll, you'll notice that I involve them a lot with uh, what I do. But enough about me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from Michigan. Uh, does this pretty much fit your, your winter so far, too? Okay, good. I thought that would play really well, The Shining, in case um, you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, this is, this is how the winter is, has been feeling, and I'm really, really excited that tomorrow is March, even though... I heard scary weather is coming. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping, yesterday we actually had a snow day in my school district, um, and uh, I'm hoping that my drive back to Michigan uh, today, or this evening, will, uh, will, will go well. Okay, now a little bit about you. Uh, how many elementary teachers do we have? Ooh, okay, cool. How many secondary teachers do we have? Okay, all right, all right, that's good, that's good. Uh, I've got some resources and some ideas here that I hope will, will play well uh, for, for all of you. Some of the tools really are going to be geared towards secondary, and some of the tools really are going to be geared towards elementary, but some of the tools play well in both areas. Uh, how many uh, dedicated at the secondary or, or elementary level, uh, how many just dedicated uh, writing ELA teachers? Okay, math teachers? No math teachers. That's all right. That's all right. Oh, yes. All right. I wish I had something to give away now just for you. For, um, any science teachers? Dedicated science teachers? Okay. Social studies, history? Okay. And the rest of you, just whatever you want to do, it's all good, right? You're not being evaluated, are you? Okay. Over evaluated? Okay. That's all right. Um, I'd like to ask a question of you and have a small little conversation with the people around you, which, yes, I know, it's scary. We have to put down our tech and not tweet and actually talk to one another. But what is the purpose of digital storytelling? I'd like you to take a moment, turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, say hi, um, and just chat real quickly. What do you think the purpose of digital storytelling is?
All right, so I am a former elementary teacher, so in three, our voices are coming down. In two, our eyes and ears are open. And in one, I just had a fantastic conversation over here. I hope you had a good conversation. Would anyone like to share something that, uh, uh, that, that stuck out in your conversation about the purpose of digital storytelling? It's OK, it's OK. I have to, oh, yeah, all right. Oh, uh, being able to deliver your message to an authentic audience. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah, yeah. Give them, give them, give them different ways of expressing themselves, and, and something bigger than just the other three little sentences. This group over here, they had some great uh, conversations. I don't know if they want to share them, but I'll share them. Um, talking about uh, uh, personal narratives, being able to share feelings, being able to share your yourself, who you are, and do it in a way that might not be as intimidating as getting up in front of a room full of people like this. Uh, I'm always fascinated by what, I, I, I say students, but actually it's people, but people are willing to put on YouTube where millions of people will watch that, but might be unwilling to do in a classroom with like 30 of their peers. Um, that, that's fascinating there. And, and, I, and, I, and I forgot earlier, I was reminded, uh, we do have an administrator here. How many administrators do we have in the room? Okay, cool, I didn't want you guys feel left out. I felt bad. I felt terrible. So, um, uh, but these tools will apply for you too. So good thoughts about digital storytelling. Um, the actual definition that is in Wikipedia, now this is not the actual definition of digital storytelling, just one, uh, refers to a short form of digital media production that allows everyday people to share aspects of their life story. Not quite as compelling as some of the answers we just heard right here. If you take a look at the Center for Digital Storytelling, which is actually a resource um, that's on my webpage, a link to it, fantastic website. I love their definition. Uh, we partner with organ or what, what they do. We partner with organizations around the world to develop programs which support individuals in rediscovering how to listen to each other and share first-person stories. And I think that really is is the whole point of storytelling. I, I have a long-held belief. That, that we as human beings, we are storytellers. That's how we communicate, you know, something as simple as, as, as a joke. You know, there's, there's a story behind that. Uh, and, uh, and the idea of us as educators is we're, we're just telling stories. We're trying to tell engaging stories so that the kids can get uh, to the content in a way that makes sense to them. Okay? So what does digital storytelling look, sound, or feel like another conversation. Go ahead. You could turn to the same people. You can turn to someone else. Let's talk about how 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 does that look? How does it sound? How does it feel?
All right, great. So in three, we're bringing it back together. In two, really great listening ears, which should be, should be easy enough to, to handle. Oh, and, and in one, um, heard some more great conversations here. And one over here, I'm going to put him on the spotlight. He's got to share. Uh, what, what, what did you say again? <laughs> Boom, gold star right there. I hope it doesn't look or feel like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I heard some other thoughts. Anyone else uh, would like to share what a digital story looks, feels, sounds like? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, similar conversation was happening right up here, too. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really where it comes from. Uh, is, is the, the power of digital storytelling is if you can connect on an emotional level, which is what we all want to do with our students, right? You know, you want to you want to form that relationship. Anyone else want to offer any thoughts? Those were great. I know those were hard to follow. Um, does anyone remember this? Photo story? Yeah. For the longest time, this was the face of digital storytelling. Um, it was, and, and it was great, right? You know, it was, Let's bring our pictures in, and the kids will narrate over them. And it was good. There are still camps out there on the internet. I don't know where they're shrinking. Maybe they're still on their uh, GeoCities websites. But um, they hold true. They are digital storytelling purists. And they feel that this form of digital storytelling is digital storytelling. And that you know, makes me kind of sad because while, yes, it's, it's, it's great and it's a fantastic, simple way, here's an image, let me tell you a story about it, works very well for Ken Burns. Um, there's so many more tools out there. Uh, here's some of the ones that uh, we're going to take a look at, some examples of uh, today. So basically, uh, my belief is echoing what you guys guys just had in this conversation right here, and this is great, is that storytelling exists on an ever-changing continuum of media, okay? Story digital storytelling doesn't have to be just one thing, and it doesn't have to always be the same thing. So if you think, you know, my digital storytelling in my classroom is movies, that's great. It doesn't always have to be movies in your classroom. Depending on the task at hand, you know, it can exist somewhere on this medium. Going from very, very traditional, something that looks kind of like a book, only in a digital form, to something very, very, um, uh, very new uh, that's heavy in social media, something that's going to allow you uh, to uh, bring in a lot of social media resources uh, and lives on the web. On that continuum is where uh, digital storytelling exists. Uh, I would urge you to check out this gentleman right here, Gardner Campbell, not to be confused with Howard Campbell, who does the, oh, Howard Gardner, sorry, the multiple intelligences guy, Gardner Campbell. Uh, did an excellent lunch keynote back in 2009 called No Digital Facelifts. You need to Google it. You need to watch it. Not now. Um, if, if you want to watch it now, that's fine. Just you know, go to a quiet corner of the room. Uh, but uh, it's a really fascinating lunch keynote in which he talks a lot about educational theory and educational models and digital storytelling. And he basically boils it all down to three practices that we need to be doing in our classrooms, in our learning environments, in our schools. And these uh, three practices are really simple. Basically, what Gardner said is that we need to make sure that students are narrating their learning experience, they're curating their learning experience, and they're sharing their learning experience. And many great teachers already do this. Uh, in the traditional sense with the pencil for many, many years, many, many decades. Students write, they take their best writing and they put it into a portfolio, they curate it, and then they share it. Traditionally, that would be at parent-teacher conferences or a student-led conference. But we have so many tools now uh, and, we, and we live so much of our lives, both educationally and personally, on the web that these three overarching uh, practices calls them recursive practices for any of you serious education geeks out there that uh, uh, like that. Three recursive practices uh, that need to be happening in our classrooms. And these are the three themes I want you to think about as we explore some of these tools. So with that having said, we're going to go ahead and explore. Uh, I'm going to keep talking, but I'm going to get away from uh, these slides so that we can go ahead 
and check out some of these tools. So the first one up is Storybird. And Storybird, anyone use Storybird, fans of Storybird? Yes, awesome. Uh, when I said digital storytelling exists on a continuum, I would put this on the end of the continuum that looks and feels very much like a traditional book. It's a great way to get into digital storytelling. It's a great way to get your students to start telling stories because a lot of it has already been done for you. Uh, and I'm going to share an example of a book that my daughter wrote a few years ago when she was in kindergarten. This is called Horse. Horse! I love horses. Horses can run fast, and horses can walk. Horses can gallop. The end, is it? Yes, it is. Um, she was, oh, I, I, I misread that. Well, uh, we were reading a bunch of uh, um, uh, Scooby Doo mysteries at that time. She was really fascinated with the end. Is it? Yes. Uh, this is a simple story. A simple story that she did in kindergarten. And yes, this is not a horse, it's a bee, that's okay. Uh, and you saw some unicorns and some, and some uh, zebras in there. Uh, that's okay. Um, because there's two things that uh, I, I, I really value about this tool and I value about digital storytelling is that uh, one, uh, you can merge other people's visuals, other people's ideas with your own. And then two, we can start to get away from the finished product. The finished product is good. Great, we, we have to have it. But we can start to move away from that. This is a work in progress, right? Yeah, okay, she doesn't have capital letters at the beginning of her sentence. That's all right. She's creating, she's telling a story. You know, if you took a look at her writing that came home that year, you know, you wouldn't be showing that necessarily to the whole world, but the process is important. And uh, what I like about Storybird, I'm gonna go ahead and create one, is that one, it's free. If you have students that are old enough, they can all have their individual accounts. If you don't have students that are old enough, you can go for an ed you can get an educator account and then create your own student accounts and have control over how those stories are uh, shared with the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, you start with some really, really beautiful artwork. These are all professional artists that have submitted their work to Storybird. And when you go to create, you get a choice of a bunch of different tags for different artwork that you might want to use. Or you can come down here to search. So I'm going to search for spring, because that's I, I need some spring today. And we'll see what we have here. Oh, we get some beautiful artwork. I like, I like this right here. I'm going to click on this. And when you click on one of the pieces of art, it tells you the author or the, uh, the artist's name right here. Links to their uh, profile where they're from, how many views, all that good stuff. You can also check out some of their other artwork. This is always the danger of doing live demos uh, at, uh, at a big conference where the wireless might be spotty, but it's holding, it's doing a good job. And if I like this, I can go ahead and click use this art. Picture book or poem. I'm gonna click on picture book. And when you click on this, it gives you this really nice interface. Here's my picture book, here's all my wonderful art. Write your story here, drag your art here. That's all you need. It's a really simple tool that mimics. I know a lot of uh, uh, elementary uh, classrooms and schools that still do those, uh, those blank white books. Does anyone still do those, the book publishing centers? We still do them in our schools as well. There's a lot of value there in a physical object. Um, but, it, but it mirrors that. It's really cool. My book, simple. And if I don't like the way it looks, I can take the picture, drag it up here, title goes at the bottom. I could drag my picture down here, title goes up there. If I want a new page, boom, I click the plus button, I've got a new page. And then I can come over here and I can drag in new artwork. So the interesting thing about Storybook is that it kind of takes the Apple approach in that we, we want this to look as gorgeous as possible. The question was, could you manipulate the size? Um, and you can't. Uh, you can do what I did right here is, you know, I can drag it and just decide where the picture goes and how much space it takes up and how much room there is for text. That's pretty much it. Um, some of the other limitations we discovered was you can only use one artist's work at a time. You can't mix and match for multiple artists, but that actually helps because then the aesthetic of the book when you're all done makes sense. Um, a tip 
if you want to use this with your students, especially your elementary students. A lot of teachers, when they first saw this in their classrooms, were like, oh, this is so exciting. We've been writing myths in fourth grade. That's a thing we do in Michigan. And uh, we want to take our myths and turn them into a storyboard, or a storybird. And the problem was they took those myths and they started writing them up and the artwork didn't match. They would find like a couple pieces that worked and then the rest of it didn't. You saw the horses that didn't quite work. So uh, we, uh, we started using it in different ways. We had teachers that started getting creative and said, you know what, I want you to write a book for me about an emotion. Right? Write a book for me about love. And Storybird fits really, really well with that thing because you can use those images um, and create the story here. Get away from the, you know what, I've written the story down on paper and I've edited it and now it's perfect and now I'm going to go to the final copy. Start the story here uh, and edit it and let it flow with the pictures. It does a really good job of, uh, of uh, auto saving. You can see this one's been saved. I'm still on Michigan time. That's why it says 11.22. Um, but it's a really, really fun thing. A couple cool things about Storybird is that you can then uh, purchase the books. So if you like this, I got a little buy link right here and you click buy and it will give you some choices. I can download it as a PDF for $1.99. And then I can go ahead and load that on my uh, iPads if I wanted to. Uh, I could load it on uh, uh, a school network drive, something like that, for the kids to read. You could do a bundle here, a bundle of uh, PDFs. So you get the, a big PDF and then a pocket size or a little mini size. Uh, and then they have soft cover, hard cover, premium hard cover. They get kind of pricey. Um, and this is actually how, oh, it doesn't have enough pages for a premium hardcover book, darn. Um, this is actually how Storybird remains free. It kind of takes the iTunes model where uh, 30 to 50% of the uh, cost of the book actually goes to the artist. So they use it as a platform for getting their art out there and you can use it for free. You could use it as uh, a nice way to send links to parents' home. Hey, if you'd like to go ahead and your, your student's really proud of their work, you go ahead and, and, and purchase it and have it, have that actual physical copy. Uh, you could even use it for fundraisers. I've known a couple of teachers that have done that. Kind of, you know, they'll go ahead and they'll uh, purchase uh, the soft cover stuff um, and then sell those. So that's a fun way to get in. And Storybird is very, very cool. It's HTML5, which means it's good for all of your devices. There's no app for it. You just go to the website on your iPhone or your iPad or your Android device. And it works just like this. Very, very cool. I like that. I like the, way, the idea of getting away from apps. Um, there's also some really cool examples right here. I'm Patty Haru's uh, uh, class. She is another Michigander. And she's got some really fun examples here of students in second grade doing books about the rules, being thankful, uh, friendship. She even has an example one here where she had sixth grade students partnering up with her kindergarten students uh, talking about friendship. It's a lot of fun uh, when you get kids, obviously, collaborating across grade levels like that. So some, some good examples there. All right, moving along. I'm going to show an app, and I'm going to show StoryKit. And I like to show StoryKit right after Storybird for two reasons. Because it kind of fits on that continuum in that space where things are still kind of like a book. OK, come on. You can do this. They're still kind of like a book, but uh, a little bit different. Now, I do apologize for Android users. Story Kit is only available on iOS, but it is free. It's an app from the, uh, the Children's International Digital Library. And uh, when you first open it up, they've got a few examples of some uh, public domain books, Humpty Dumpty, Rocket, Three Bears. They look pretty old. But what I like about this is that it's an open canvas. It's not like some of the really popular apps like Toontastic. Anyone use Toontastic? Or, uh, like the puppet apps, things like that. Those are great apps. You know, and they have free versions. And then they throw advertisements in there. And then they do, oh, but you can download this for 99 cents and everything. I like this. It's not flashy. It's not fancy. But it's a great uh, uh, blank canvas. I can do simple things like adding a picture. I can take, ooh, I don't want to get a picture of that light. That would be terrible. There we go. Boom. Grab that picture. Drop it in here. I can manipulate it. Any way I want. There we go. I can also add photos that I have on my camera roll. If I want to do that, I can add some text. Hello, isn't great. Oops. Teacher 
100% ice. There we go. Boop. And that drops it in there. I can go ahead and I can resize that. If I want to, I can add audio. I got to have some great conversations with some amazing teachers about digital storytelling here at ICE. I got to have some great conversations. Oh, you can kind of hear it. That's okay. I'm just going to go ahead and drop that in. Boop. So I got this little sound thing right there. And if I want to, I can also draw. So I've got my brush. If I want to do like a background, I could do that. And that's going to drop that right in. So you can see it's pretty flexible. Um, as far as a tool goes, it's not the it's not the you know the pre-made everything's there background select my characters. This is for people that really want to start from scratch, um, and then you can share these as well. Uh, I can add multiple pages if I want to, and when you share them, uh, what you have to do is you have to uh, enter your email address that you use on your device for it. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for uh, shared devices. If you're sharing carts, devices you keep in your room, or if they are shared devices, bless you, make sure that you take your email off the device when you're done. And uh, what it does is it sends some links. Let me go ahead. You can go away now. Bye bye. It sends uh, links to stories that look like this. So, not flashy, not fancy. But it's free, and, and it is what you make of it. And I like this because I share this with all my teachers. That we put it. It's an iPad. It's an iPhone app, but it does work on the iPad. Um, and my teachers that have iPads in the district love this. Yeah, question. How do I get my phone up on the screen? I'm using a, uh, an app called Reflector. You can use Airwalk, uh, uh, Air Server as well to do the same thing. Um, it's just making my computer pretend that it's an Apple TV. Um, but anyways. Uh, the teachers in my district love this tool because it's really good for the uh, the elementary set, and uh, they get a, they get a kick out of then having these stories uh, on the iPads, so they can tell stories about just you know what happened that day, um, document uh, the learning process, maybe a science activity, something like that. A lot of fun stuff there. All right, so I'm going to move into the territory that's more for uh, uh, middle school, uh, more for high school, and this is. The wall machine. How many of you have ever seen those tools that do like the fake, create a fake Facebook wall, that sort of thing? Okay, wall. That's what wall machine is. Um, you do have to connect with Facebook to use it. So if you're in a district where you can't get to Facebook for your students, they might have to do it on their own personal devices. Wow, cool music going. On. I don't know where that came from. Um, but uh, uh, it, 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 it's a great tool uh, to talk about um, narration. Uh, because Facebook, you know, is a story. It's just multiple people telling a story. So, as example, here's the story, uh, the history of Afghanistan, and Afghanistan is complaining 211 years ago why everyone keeps invading us. Geez, guys, chill out. And then the Soviet Union stops by and says, "I just want a little bit of land." The United Kingdom says, "Hey, hey, hey, that's not cool. We want some of this too." Um, and then the Afghan women chime in 196 years ago. You know, uh, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, um, and you could see that uh, with some of these examples, like Macbeth. This is one of my favorites. Um, you can play with it, and you can have a little bit, especially with older students. You can have a little bit of uh, of starkiness. Here, Macbeth is in a relationship with Lady Macbeth. Okay, before Act One, it's a lot of fun because you can play with the uh, the things, and of course, Lady Macbeth likes that. Such a man you are that I may take thee as a shield and fend off the world with thy strength. <laughs> and of course, Macbeth, thou art the love of my life. For thee, I shall rip the world asunder. So what a fun way to talk about Shakespeare, right? And which is not something that you often get to do, you know, talk about Shakespeare necessarily uh, in a fun way. Uh, and then, of course, there's some activities, some events, Macbeth attending meeting with the witches. Notice that has no likes on it there. Um, which, uh, let's talk about that. Um, you know, oh, Macbeth is now friends with the three witches. Um, and, and it goes on and on. Uh, and it, right here, I will never be able to cleanse myself of this picture of bloody hands. And, you know, it's a lot of fun. This is not, it's, it's not Facebook Live. Sometimes I show this and people are like, oh my gosh, wait, this is, this is like live Facebook and stuff. No, 
This is all uh, pre-constructed by the students, and it's a way for them to narrate what they're learning using their own vernacular, using their own language today, and have some fun with it. Yeah. Fake book. Yeah, that's another good one. Um, if you Google, yeah, you have to have accounts for that. Um, you can also do uh, classtools.net. If you Google classtools.net and Facebook, um, there's 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 a there's a one right there. I used to show that in this presentation, but it was a couple of Facebook things. I thought one was enough. Oh, and then here's a big you know Macbeth Hall who are invited. I'll go all the way to the bottom. And Macduff, Macbeth is no more. Send him no more messages, for they will fall upon deaf ears. All right. So uh, a lot of fun that you can have. Macbeth attended battle against fate. Uh, a lot of fun that you can have with this. There's one in here for the atom. And I love the way that it starts with Aristotle. Hey, dudes, today I just watched the movie Last Airbender and discovered that matter is made up of four basic substances, earth, water, and fire. OK, now that movie was terrible. Cartoon is fantastic. Movie is terrible. But um, again, you know, letting kids have fun, letting them express themselves. We talked about their you know, who they are, their personalities. These tools allow that type of narration. Um, Mr. Theory chimes in, sure, bro, for like 2,000 years, ha ha. And uh, then we get uh, James Chadwick. He comes in, and, and J.J. Thompson, and they start talking about the, uh, you know, the plum pudding model. And Niels Bohr chimes in. It's just a lot of fun, role playing, storytelling at its purest, and uh, tools like this are are a lot of fun. They create the story themselves. When you go in, you get like a like a dummy Facebook wall, and uh, you actually I wasn't sure if I'd be able to connect uh, this morning or not. You get a dummy Facebook wall, and so it could be just one student that has created all of that. Yeah, so you get the choice to do that. Oh man, they're gonna get my public profile, friend list, and email address. Okay, I recently went through and revoked all the access to all the apps and everything. But see, it looks just like this. And so I can control, I can go ahead and upload an image right there. I can change what's here, the like, comments. Oh, Mark Zuckerberg likes this. And then I can just keep adding from there. So, fun tool. Uh, VoiceThread, any VoiceThread users here? All right, VoiceThread I really love because it, it straddles that narration and sharing um, that we talked about, uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, you could do a lot of fun things. Here's something I did with uh, my third graders. VoiceThread uh, is sort of like the spiritual successor of Photo Story, in that you can upload photos and do voice narration over it. So if you're if you're holding out for a new version of Photo Story, it's not going to happen. VoiceThread is is your way to go. Let me show you. Here's examples I did with third graders quite a while ago. We're And for this project, oh, you can see uh, chimed in. I shared all of these. These are other teachers uh, from around the state that have left comments on this. Uh, I have it set up to where uh, comments are moderated. So that's really cool because students can uh, put their work out there in video form or uh, narrated form over still pictures. And then they can the offer up comments. To walk on water. So How for I this particular assignment. To worship upon this stuff. In my name would be Marvelous Water Walking Emma. Water I could walking walk Emma on water all day. Whispering into the microphone. Uh, but for this particular assignment, uh, I took all of the students' photos, and then I, uh, I was actually doing a whole bunch of different uh, standards. This one they had to manipulate and edit digital images. So I had them choose one superpower that they could have, and then they had to create this, uh, their, their superhero using their photo, and then they had to write a story about that one superpower. Uh, and a lot of times when I show some of these tools, teachers go, you know what? It's really great, Ben, but I've got like three computers in my classroom. I, I, can't, I can't do this on a regular basis. And for something like this, I actually did this. Uh, the students did their work on their computers, but then I only had one account. Um, and you do have to, you do have to pay uh, for VoiceThread, but I think it's worth the money. I had one account, and I took all of their photos, uploaded them to the single VoiceThread, and then I went ahead and had them come up and narrate over on my computer. So it's, it's, it's quite possible over the course of a week. So it's quite possible to do something like this in the classroom. This boy has uh, Super Mario powers, obviously. If I had a superpower, 
it would be to go into video games. My name would be Mario. I would fight mushrooms. My friend, my friend's Sorry, name would be. Let you suffer through the whispers. Uh, VoiceThread's a lot of fun, and you can get creative with it, especially up at the secondary level. If you go to VoiceThread.com, you do a search for French. There are a lot of foreign language teachers that are using this as a language, uh, a, a foreign language learning lab. So one of the teachers in my district wrote a grant. I helped her write a grant this fall, and she's got all of her French students that are doing this now. I don't have any examples uh, yet to share. I can't wait till I have them. Um, but they're using this as a way to practice speaking and listening French because one of the big things in our language department is that they want to make sure that the students always have an opportunity to speak the language and the teacher is listening to them, evaluating them. It's kind of difficult to do when you've got you know 150 students uh, and that can make those, uh, uh, those, those oral weeks really difficult. So they do it this way where you know you put a, a prompt up there for the students and then have them speak in French. There we go, French alphabet. Salut les élèves, voilà l'alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. All right, so you get the idea. And you could have a lot of fun with this. Uh, other subject areas, I've seen teachers use VoiceThread for MathCast. So you go ahead and you do the, you know, the Khan Academy style boarding like that. You take that video, upload it to this, ask students to leave comments, or just put a problem up there, upload it, ask students to, to, to solve it or to share how they solved it. And the more people that comment on this, uh, I, I don't have the ability to comment on this one. Uh, let me go back to this link and I'll show you. Uh, this because I am logged in. Uh, but the nice thing about VoiceThread is that if you are working from just one computer or a few, let me go ahead and pause this. I can click on comment and I have a number of different ways to comment. I can click type and leave a text comment. I can click record if I have a microphone. I can leave an audio comment. If I don't have a device like that, maybe I'm on my phone, I can click the phone. It will call me and when it calls me, it will let me record my voice and then upload it. So that's a really, really cool, really powerful tool. VoiceThread has been around for a long time, long before the App Store, things like that. It does have an app, but it's been around for a long time and it's a very, very powerful tool uh, for digital storytelling. Okay, one more thing here. Bye-bye VoiceThread. And that's Storyfy. Anyone seen Storyfy know what Storyfy is? Up to this point, most of these tools have just been about narration. Uh, and sharing, VoiceThread definitely about sharing, Facebook about sharing. Storyfy does the narration, it does the, uh, the sharing, and it does the curating. Now this is a secondary, I don't want to say that this is a secondary only tool, but it's a tool that really lends itself very well uh, to the secondary mindset. What Storyfy does is it lets you curate information media from around the various social networks, from around the web. So here's an example of one that I did. Read Around the Planet makes me happy. Uh, there's a big Read Around the Planet collaboration. It's a video conference collaboration that happens between Canada, the US, Mexico, and the UK every year during March's Reading Month. Does anyone do it, Read Around the Planet? No? Oh, OK. It's cool stuff. I get to help facilitate that. Um, and I want to share. And it's really difficult to share because it's, it's like a, an hour long uh, video conference and it's kind of difficult to share that other than recording and just putting it up there. Uh, so I take pictures and I post them on Twitter and then I use Storyfy to bring that in. So what does that look like? Let me go ahead and click edit right here. And Storyfy allows you to build stories using blocks and now it's a little bit funky right here just because of the resolution on my screen. Uh, but I have the ability to add just simple text and links. But then I also have the ability to add in things from Twitter. So I'm going to do a search real quick on Twitter for hashtag rap14. Because this is the hashtag I've been using. Connect your Twitter account. I already connected my Twitter account. OK, I'll sign in again. That's all right. And there we go. Here's some pictures that I have been sharing on Twitter 
with that hashtag. So if you're very active on Twitter and using hashtags, you can go ahead and do that. And I can just drag these and pull these right in. So uh, uh, one of the fifth grade classes, they did some research about the Olympics, and they were connecting with a classroom in uh, uh, South Carolina, and they each took turns talking about that. I could take this picture, and I could drop it right in here to my story. So this is my tweet, and the picture from my tweet, here's my account, Matt on at Tech. Boom, right there. If I want to, I can add for some of these other resources as well. So this would be really cool. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get rid of this because I don't want this here. And I can't add it. So that's all right. I just won't save it. This would be really cool for, uh, I had a teacher who is no longer with me that uh, did current events. And I could use it to build a, uh, a digital uh, resource. Let's talk about the Ukraine, current events, those sorts of things. So I could go ahead and just do a Google search right here. Oh, I don't want that. Okay. And I can, uh, I can bring in resources from the web. Here's one from the, uh, the UK government site that was posted on the 28th. I'll put that right there. I can go ahead and search Twitter. And if I want to bring in some tweets, you know, help make this relevant to my students, they're on Twitter. Okay. Now, this is not something that I would necessarily be doing live in front of a classroom because you never know what you're going to find if you're just searching Twitter and other of these things openly. I would do this before and then use that recess uh, afterwards. Okay. Ukraine burning. Ukraine Rising, part one. This is from Vice. That's actually a, a, a very interesting news outlet. Okay. So I can go ahead and start building this up. And the unrest there. Uh, I can go ahead and I can on the fly, you know, sort of build this page using social media from around the web and then use it as a resource in my classroom to lead a discussion, conversation. Or I could have it with students, uh, uh, have them create stories uh, using media uh, to, to, to help them with connecting literature to life, uh, talking about current events, that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, Mished movement, this is a Twitter chat, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. You guys have a chat as well, IL, uh, ILED chat. Does anyone participate in that chat? You participate in that chat? When is it? Monday nights at 9 p.m. Hop on Twitter, hashtag ILED chat, right? Um, so Michigan, we have the same thing. Wednesdays at 8, and we use this as a way to archive. So you saw in the editor here, I just went ahead and I searched for Mished. And then I take all these tweets and I plop it in here. So if you can't make this, or if you've got those people that are like, you know what, you've really got to be on Twitter, and they're like, I don't want to do Twitter. I'm not, Twitter is not my thing. That's okay. Okay, here, let me make a story file for you and pull out some tweets that you really like. And here is the entire archive of our Twitter chat right here. Okay, so I know that this session went kind of fast here, and I know that I said there were six things. I've only showed you five things. So the last thing I wanted to remind you of is that we have all of these mobile devices now, and as we talk about, let me close this, as we talk about apps that are good for digital storytelling and, uh, and websites and everything, I think the most powerful app that is often overlooked is the camera app. That's on all of our devices, just turning it on and allowing it to capture. I have a third grade teacher uh, that started this a couple years ago. Third grade is a big time for students in our district because they're moving up from the early elementary to the later elementary. And there's 900 kids in our later elementary. It's a lot of kids. And so it's really intimidating. So he wants to encourage them. He wants to build that connection. He wants to show them that they're valuable. So he does this project at the beginning of the year where he gives them the iPads and the flip cams. And he says, teach us something. Every single student in this classroom has value, has knowledge. What can you teach us? And I love this video right here. Uh, from Natalie, because she taught everyone how to make a sea glass. Necklace. I make sea glass necklaces. 
First, I choose a piece of sea glass that has jagged edges so I can wrap the wire around it. I need to get enough wire to wrap around and make a loop so I can. What you do is you bend this over, make a loop, wrap this right around. It. And then, it. then you take off the extras and then you put on some string. And here are some of them I finished. And that's how you make a sea glass necklace. It's simple. And that's something any of us can do. We all have the time. It doesn't matter what subject area you teach, what grade level you teach. We all have the time, especially at the beginning of the year, um, to, to honor your students' abilities and what they have. So that's, that's, that's the sixth way, is, is just Turn the camera on and, and see what you can capture and find those stories. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you for coming by. Have a great rest of the conference.